All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for sticking around. I know we're getting closer to lunch. So um, today's uh, panel is it's a different kind of panel. Uh, we're going to talk about gamification, which I know is a uh, much talked about uh, and sometimes very polarizing topic to talk about. Um, but I can promise you this. Um, these guys know about gamification. And, and the point of it is it, it can show real demonstrable results and ROI. And that's been, I know, a topic of conversation for the last couple days is where the blank is the money. Uh, well, a lot of it is happening in gamification, what's happening in both social games and then outside of social games where game mechanics are being employed. So just to start, um, kind of who, who's, I, I don't want to treat the audience a certain way, but who, who's heard of gamification? Show of hands. All right. OK, and who's, um, who's actually employed gamification as part of your brand marketing? OK, and who believes gamification is just hype? OK, not nearly as many as I thought, so I guess I'm not going to people. distract three people. <laughs> OK, so just to define gamification uh, for the audience, we're all on the same page and provide some context. Uh, gamification is based on the thesis that brand marketers can use some of the same principles and general philosophies that game developers are using to incentivize behavior and reach a desired outcome in really anything, anywhere. Uh, two, fascinating, fa two fascinating examples of gamification that I've seen in the real world are, number one, in Switzerland, the Swiss government is using gamification to reward citizens for good behavior. So you know those cameras that sit on the side of the road that catch you when you're going like five miles an hour over the speed limit? Sweden, or Switzerland, or Sweden, I'm not sure which one. I think Sweden, Switzerland. Sweden. 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 They're using cameras to catch people that are going slower than the speed limit. And if you're going slower than the speed limit, you earn points and you get entered into a lottery where you can win money from the pool that's created by the people that are going over the speed limit. Gamification, which is actually working. Another one which is, which is uh, having a lot of influence here in the States is um, the University of Washington recently created a game called Fold It, which uh, encouraged uh, collaboration and crowdsourcing of trying to figure out how to make the most accurate protein folding that would further the research for AIDS development. And um, this, is a, this is a puzzle that had confounded scientists for over 13 years. And the gaming audience solved the puzzle in 10 days, what had confounded scientists for over 13 years, and furthered AIDS, AIDS research by uh, a very long time. They, they aren't able to quantify it. But they were able to achieve that by giving points and bragging rights to the collaborators who came into this game and figured out how to use Fold It to create proteins that would help further uh, research and AIDS. So gamification is real. It's here. There's demonstrable results. Um, its foundation is in social games, and it's moved on to entertainment and media, and then on to brand marketing. So I think we have the perfect panel to talk about the evolution. So um, I'm going to start with um, Matthew. Matthew is the CEO of Fresh Planet, which is a great um, social game and a client of ours. Um, so Matthew, um, throughout all your games, um, what's the single most surprising trend you've seen in terms of social behavior and engagement? Uh, well, we just launched a game called Spa Life, and it's a game targeted at women. You manage your own spa. And uh, we were very surprised because the, I mean, we knew it, but we, we saw that the most, uh, the, 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 the group or the demographics paying the most were women, of course, but mostly women over 50 and 50 years old. So the older the women, the more likely they are to pay, and also the more likely they are to be viral and invite friends. That was very surprising for us. OK, OK. So um, can you uh, roll the tape on the, uh, the Fresh Planet? I want to show you guys some of the work that they've done for, um, for Clarence in particular. Yeah, this is, this is basically a game, it's, it's called a time management game. It's, it's modeled after the very famous Dino Dash games uh, built in 2004. And basically, you, are, you manage your own spa. You have to greet customers and you know, improve uh, the look and feel of your spa. You have to uh, make money. You have to make sure customers are happy. And uh, we worked from the ground up with the Clarence brand, which is um, a brand, cosmetic brand uh, from, from, from France. And we included their products and their visuals and their corporate identity very early on. But uh, we made sure that the integration of the brand was very subtle. Otherwise, I think it doesn't work. And we have great results. We launched the game uh, a month and a half ago. We have half a million players per month right now. And it's growing very, very rapidly. 
So that's a great example of a brand recognizing the power of social games. Now, I think a lively debate that we've had behind the scenes are, when is it right for a brand to build a game? When is it right for a brand to employ game mechanics as part of their engagement and loyalty building? And when is it time to just kind of stay away and leave that for the social game development companies? So, um, Lee, I'm going to turn uh, the question to you. Um, Lee uh, is is the man behind the Pawn Stars Facebook game, uh, modeled after the very popular series, um, chart busting series on A&E. Um, maybe you could roll the tape real quick on the, uh, the Pawn Stars game. Think you have what it takes to be a Pawn Star? What do you want for it? Well, talk is cheap, so put your money where your mouth is. Deal. Play the Pawn Stars game on Facebook. Buy and sell items, get expert opinions, and most importantly, turn a profit. See if you can achieve Pawn Stardom. Go to ViaPawnStar.com to play now. So um, you guys all probably know Pawn Stars, um, but how many of you have actually, how many of you pl have played the game on Facebook, Pawn Stars? Okay, well, a lot of people are playing the game. <laughs> Lee, can you maybe give us <laughs> bad example, note. Okay, so <laughs> tell us a, a little bit about the success you've had with Pawn Stars, the game, versus the TV show and how you've done new audience development, um, brand extension, and more importantly, everyone, Lee is part of a marketing team, and he is transforming what people traditionally think of marketers as a cost center and turning into a profit center. So you should listen to Lee when he talks about what he's done uh, for Pawn Stars on Facebook. So I think the, the background is we've got a television franchise in Pawn Stars that is not only the highest rated show on the History Channel, but also one of the highest rated shows in cable television over the last two years. And so our goal was to extend the popularity of that brand, both the History brand and the Pawn Stars brand, into the digital space, and in this case, into the social gaming space. For us, it was an opportunity um, to not only allow the diehard fans of the television program to engage with us um, after the show ended and, and extend that experience in, in, online, but also an opportunity to bring new users into the fold. So, because we're in the social space, we hope that our diehard fans are playing the game, inviting their friends, and we're turning on new people to not only play the game, but watch the television series on air. Um, and you know, within the first month after we launched, we had over a million installs. Um, and what we saw as the game picked up momentum is that on a daily basis, we actually had more people playing the Pawn Stars game than visiting the History Channel website. So there has been some scale, perhaps not in this room, but uh, we've had some success out there. One of our, um, certainly our, our goal was uh, to market and promote the television series. We had hoped that we could also generate revenue from the game, as Dan mentioned. And we do that through the sale of, of uh, virtual goods. And, you know, we'd read a lot about microtransactions, uh, traditionally, I think, targeted at women. Um, you know, I think we, we mentioned that earlier. We didn't know if it would success in, if it would succeed, excuse me, in what has been a, a male-dominated audience for the show Pawn Stars. And we ended up having tremendous success. So... The game has generated um, more revenue than we ever imagined, and we've ultimately been able to use the success here to develop new games that will be coming out shortly. And, and what are some of the, um, the metrics, aside from the monthly active users and daily active users, that you guys use internally to determine, is this game a success? Is it something that we should continue to invest in? Yeah, so above and beyond, I think, what the standard reach metrics that you mentioned, we're looking at how much time people are spending playing the game how frequently they're coming back. I think one of the themes has been engagement uh, throughout this conference, and we're seeing very high levels of engagement. People coming back day in and day out for months at a time. Um, one of the other things we're also you know, monitoring closely is revenue, the revenue generated from those microtransactions. So we look at ARPU, right, average revenue per user, and we hope to use that data to not only monitor what's happening, but then feed that back into the game development process. So we test you know, different approaches uh, to, you know, we, we might uh, attempt to understand the dynamics around sharing. So how do we get people to share the game more frequently um, and, and test different messaging there? Uh, we may also look at uh, how we can grow that revenue stream, how we can grow that ARPU by testing, and ultimately that data, like I said, feeds back into the development process, and we make changes to the game accordingly. Okay, yeah, so metrics um, within the social game, social app, and mobile app space, very different than the traditional kind of web metrics, the page views, the unique visitors. We're talking more about stuff like K-Factor, like how viral is your application, ARPU, average revenue per paying user, 
um, and you know, day one virality, day seven engagement, and ultimately long-term value. And that's, I think, the power of social games and mobile and social applications is you can measure the customer economics from day one all the way on through year two, year three, year four, as long as you have that unique identifier. So um, now I'm going to turn the conversation to Chris. Chris is the CEO of Badgeville, who's really taking game mechanics and gamification to a whole other level. So Chris, maybe you can talk a little bit about how you're taking some of the philosophies that the game developers are using and applying it to brand marketing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think you know, one of the reasons why we have so much awareness here for gamification is because it's such a broad term. So you know, these examples that we saw are really about kind of really the gamey aspects of gamification. Um, you know, I would char characterize on maybe on the other end of the spectrum, anything that really modernizes your experience, uh, makes your experience social, uh, is focused on engaging and retaining your users and your audience, and f um, encourages and motivates and inspires your audience to connect with you more deeply, all falls under the, the um, definition of gamification. And you know, we work with retailers, community sites, content producers. Um, in, on the external web, connecting with your consumers and your customers, it's really about how do you drive uh, affinity, how do you feel like, uh, how do you help your customer feel like they're being rewarded for their attention and their loyalty? Um, a really simple example for everybody that's in brand marketing here is, you know, do you have, you know, um, look at American Express, the black card, platinum card. Do you have a black card and platinum card and so, you know, uh, gold card system for your users? And do your users know if they're a platinum card holder right now? Have you recognized them for their attention and their loyalty? And have you kind of promoted and incentivized their actions to kind of engage more deeply with you? And then we also see internal applications. We work with large companies like uh, IBM, Deloitte, and others, where they actually want to use these same techniques and drive internal uh, employee performance. Uh, and usually it's not called gamification, it's called performance management. Um, but these techniques are highly effective. Uh, I would suggest everybody at least take a look at some of the things that you could be doing around uh, engaging with consumers more deeply, or even using these techniques internally to kind of inspire and promote uh, employee performance. Um, because they're, they, they're actually um, tremendously um, effective. And, and I, was in, um, I was in Chris's office um, in uh, Silicon Valley last week, and he showed me a little bit of his analytics dashboard, and I was fascinated that they looked just like the kind of metrics that these guys are using with our software, Contagent, and it really uh, made it very clear to me that gamification truly is um, taking a lot of the standards that have been created in game development and blending them into the, the world of brand advertising. So what are, what are some of the metrics that, that you guys are using, and what are some of the really great results that you're seeing? Yeah, and so I, you know, I would say uh, social gamers didn't invent gamification. They've really just perfected it and made it a science. And so you know, traditional metrics you know, in, in brand might be you know, uh, page views. How many page views do we get? Or you know, and maybe more, more recently, how many likes do we have? Uh, but I think you know, what really people are looking for is kind of how do I truly understand the loyalty segmentation of my audience? Who's a low loyalty user? Who's medium loyalty? Who's high loyalty? How do we move those medium loyalty users uh, into the high loyalty bucket? And what are all the variety of techniques? Uh, status, reputation, incentives, rewards, social rewards, um, privileges, labels, uh, financial. What are all the techniques that we can use to kind of move our audience towards our desired business goals? Um, and you know, um, I know your company, Dan, does this very well, Contagent. Uh, we provide analytics to our customers as well. And really the focus there is how do we help you act um, and think like a social game developer and really understand kind of the behavioral metrics around your business um, and also kind of help support this shift away from just kind of quantitative things like page views and more into kind of the qualitative aspects of truly understanding loyalty and, and kind of uh, the health of your community. Got it. And, and, and I, think, uh, I think a theme that you're seeing here is um, whether it's social games or it's brands using gamification, it's a coming together of development teams and marketing teams. Um, I think traditionally marketers have tried to build and developers have been focused on product. Gamification and employing game mechanics are fundamental to both product and marketing campaigns. So it's created this kind of unique collaborational force going on between engineering and marketing. And I think Fresh Planet, you guys, I know you're using our dashboard. Um, you guys, I assume, are making a lot of decisions from a development and production side, but also on a user acquisition side. So 
tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, we, uh, we monitor our um, dashboard on a daily basis and we make decisions based on this. So we're looking at you know, acquisition, engagement, and monetization. Uh, and we use a lot of funnels, for example. We try to identify where you know, players are dropping. Is it in level five, level six, or is it when we ask them something specific in the game? And then we make assumptions on why you know, something is wrong in the game, and then we test different solutions. And we do lots of A-B testing, A-B-C testing, for example. And when we find the right uh, development, then we keep it and we move on to the next problem to solve. Okay, so because, we, because there's so much big data flowing through these applications, you can do real-time A-B testing and get results, as long as your audience is big enough, yes. get results pretty quickly. So Chris, do you, um, uh, for your clients, uh, I know it's brand marketing, mm -hmm. but are you starting to see kind of a, a merging of brand marketing and direct response marketing kind of coming together because of the ability to test and kind of refine? Well, it's not just the testing, but then I think that data is now surfacing hugely actionable opportunities for customers. So for example, you know, if you can start to identify which groups of your audience are lapsing, and that if you could just kind of reach out and prod them or touch them or kind of move them along to re-engage, you know, what if you could use these technologies to kind of surface those opportunities? And so that might trigger you know, maybe an email campaign or some other kind of uh, activity to kind of bring them back right before they've turned into, you know, let's say, you know, a, a dead user. And so social gaming does this really well. They've kind of turned it into a science. And I think now brand marketers are starting to realize that they're, you know, I think all of this is under the guise of how do we start to measure and influence behavior and really maximize engagement with our audience. Right, okay. So we have one minute left, so that's 20 seconds each. The question for brand marketers is, how do you make the decision between uh, building a game to extend your brand, uh, employing gamification tactics to increase engagement and loyalty on top of your applications or website, or just to kind of stay away and kind of keep doing what you're doing. We, I know there's a lively debate around this, so um, Matthew, I'll start with you, and Chris, I'll let you round it up. I think you want to make a game, first of all, if you have you know, uh, a fairly large budget, it, it's, it's pretty expensive to make your own game, but also it's very, very flexible. Uh, it lasts a very, very long time, and you can learn a lot by doing your own game, and it, the flexibility is amazing. Okay, Lee? Well, I think in part it depends upon your objectives. <clears throat> if, you want, if you want to build an evergreen relationship with your customer base, um, you have to think more broadly, and that might be a better opportunity for a gamification strategy that is evergreen. If you're looking to promote a particular event or capitalize on something that is short term, you might build one game to focus exclusively on that issue. Okay, and Chris? And I think, yeah, building on those comments, uh, think about loyalty, think about your users, and think about engaging more deeply with them. Um, and, you know, I guess assess, you know, do we have an experience that really kind of engages our customer for the long term, and how can we really motivate and inspire that? And use metrics. And <laughs> with that, thank you very much, guys. Thank you. <laughs> Great conversation.